Amen. Amen. Um, this morning, uh, and if you hadn't had any notes, I think there are some uh, on the back table. We also have the notes in the app. Um, but this morning we're going to discuss, uh, it's okay to be old-fashioned. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought that may pique a couple of people's interest. Um, you know, when you think about the term old-fashioned, uh, generally speaking, when it's used, it's used in a negative connotation in the world that we're living in today. Oh, that's old-fashioned. That's something that you really, you know, they're saying that you maybe shouldn't do or you should get away from. Um, but I wanted to give you uh, what the, the definition of the word is. Uh, and it's defined as in or according to styles or types no longer current or common, not modern. So leave that up there for a second for me, Jay. Um, you know, uh, it, so it, old-fashioned is not just something, uh, but it could be a way, it could be a practice, could be some way that you go about uh, doing something, how you think about things or whatever, uh, but it's according to styles or types, no longer current um, uh, or, or common, so less people do it uh, than other people. Uh, it's not considered modern. Um, and so I put in your notes the things that are uh, uh, old-fashioned are a lot of times thought uh, to be uh, out of style, out of date. Uh, they're replaced uh, by these things that are more modern or, or whatever. And so the question that I have for you this morning is, you know, what are some examples of things or ways uh, that are considered old-fashioned today? And then I'd like you to tell me uh, what has replaced it. Handwritten thank you notes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry for anybody in here still sporting some good sideburns. Okay. <laughs> that was great, Daniel. Thank you for that. All right. What now? Uh, <laughs> rotary telephones. <laughs> That's right. What did you say, Jim? Handwritten letters, so that goes to what Amanda Smith was saying, uh, thank you notes uh, uh, that are out there, handwritten letters. Did somebody say horse and buggies? <laughs> How old are y'all? No. What? Common sense. Uh, Okay, front, front porches. What else? Uh, interpersonal communication. Well, uh, oh, so you, you, you mean in person, though. So, so, okay, in person communication, face to face, we'll put it that way. Uh, face to face communication and all that stuff. Now, you know, people don't even want to call you, they like to text. I'm just telling y'all, you know how much I like to talk. I much rather talk than I do do this. Okay, so if you if you text me, you maybe open the door for a phone call, and I know that you got your phone because you just text me. Okay, so be very careful, Jessica. <laughs> she's, she's looking over there because Jessica will try to text in a minute. And I'm like, listen, I'm not going through this long conversation and misspelling everything with my big old thumbs on there. And I, I do like to text, but absolutely, people don't even want to talk to you on the telephone. Um, so there, what you know, what we have differences in some technology uh, we talked about, and and as I put in your notes, I don't want to. Uh, we want you to hear what I am not saying uh, today. Uh, it is, there's no doubt uh, that as our society uh, advances, uh, especially when it comes to in the area of technology, um, that certain things are going to become obsolete. Certain things are going to, uh, you know, uh, get replaced with more modern and better uh, items or better ways of doing things. Uh, I am thankful uh, for the washing machine because I'm just not sure of this, you know, thing on a washing board or on a rock or something like that and rolling it through there those those are good dishwashers you know we're good this cell phone has more power than the the first computers that we had that would take up this entire walls of the entire church uh you know in here uh, i know a lot of people in here as resistive as you may be to certain matters of technology that a cell phone uh, has been something that's been good for you to be able to have to be able to talk to people wherever they may be um you know, there's all kinds of technology in your house 
uh, that, you, that you like, microwave ovens. You know, how would people eat today <laughs> without a microwave? Uh, crock pot, uh, diff- different things that are, uh, that are out there. Um, and so those things are, are, are wonderful. It's, it's okay to be modern. You know, so they're not, this is not a message necessarily uh, against modernity. Um, <clears throat> but just because something's old doesn't mean you should throw it away, right? I, you ever watch American Pickers? You know, them shows like that? I'm looking at the show and I'm thinking, they're digging through trash. And they're like, oh, look at this. It's the, it's, it's, what do you call the little emblems on the front of cars and stuff. And they're looking at the person and say, how much you want to take? How much will you send me that for? They said, oh, I'll send it to you for $5. Oh, that's not good enough. I'll give you 100 What? It's all kind of trash. I don't throw nothing away. I'm just waiting for the American Pickers to come by the house, you know, <laughs> 40 or 50 years and dig through my trash and put me on TV and, you know, uh, but, but there, there are plenty of things that are, are old that have tremendous amounts of value. There are certain practices and ways of thinking that are old that shouldn't be discarded too, right? Okay, because modern items or practices, if they're going to replace something, they ought to be better than what they're replacing, Right? They ought to work better, be better, be a better way of doing things, you know, all the rest of that. Um, and, and so I, I put a quote out on Facebook yesterday in, in introducing this. And the quote is, it is better to be old-fashioned and right than to be up-to-date and wrong. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and and I, I think about I was um, trying to, to help a kid one time in a, in a class uh, do some math. And I was looking at the paper that the teacher had, and, you know, I was helping a teacher. I was subbing in a class one day, and I, 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 they said, well, you're going to have a math group. And I said, oh, great, math. I, I like math. I know how to do math. And we're sitting down. It's third grade or something. And I'm trying to tell the kid, no, this is how you do it. He goes, no, I, I draw blocks. I said, why? <laughs> you just carry the one, you know. Take the five down, the five now it's four. You, you take a sheet of paper, th- take a sheet of paper this big to do f- five times seven. You got to work all that because you got to have enough room to draw a picture. And I thought, well, I I don't know how to do that, you know. And I, I t- I'm I'm stupid. I got a college education and I can't do this simple math problem because I didn't know how to draw blocks. Um, about things, and so I'm at home, and I'm just, you know how, I'm venting about it to Brooke, and I'm just thinking, this is just ridiculous, and she goes, well, but you have to understand, you know, Corey, that uh, back when they were learning before, that they were just teaching one way, and then Deb just meant that all these kids had to learn this way, and I thought, oh, these government-trained people, uh, I'm sorry, all these teachers, I got tons of teachers in here, and I'm at home with one, but look, guess what, how many ways can a teacher really teach it? You end up having to pick one or two. A teacher can't stand there and teach 30 different ways to do math, you know. So at some point, the kids are going to have to, you may have to figure I know they try to get you to do it, but it's impossible, okay, uh, for you to be able to do that. It's only a logical brain to me. I'm thinking, you know, I get there's different ways to to do it, and that's wonderful. If you want to have this panoply of different ways that are out there. But when people go through life, there's only one way sometimes. You know, to go, and you just got to have to figure those things out. But that's just one example of somehow things have changed, and it's been to the good. Some things in education have been good, <laughs> some things have not uh, been too good. But our society, when you look around today, uh, it appears that we are up to date, right? Uh, you look around, you got all these things. Everybody wants to throw off the old stuff, and they want they got their own new ways and and new ways of thinking about things, new ways of doing stuff. But when you look at a lot of the modern items and practices that are out there, and I'm not saying every one, but when you look at a lot of the things that are out there, they're a hundred times worse than what they replaced. You know, the effects are not helping things. They seem to be going better. So uh, that trend is not just in, folks, the, the secular world when we're talking about uh, things, not just in education. That trend is inside of religion. And I mean religion as far as everything religion, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, all the rest of them, you know, Christians, Jews, uh, and certainly inside of the modern church uh, today, this idea of modernity, the modern things, uh, you know, replacing stuff and it not being quite as good uh, certainly has found its way inside the church. 
I'm going to submit to you on the outset that uh, it may be wise for us to go back to some of our old ways uh, than to keep some insane, I'll call it, modern trends. Uh, let's take a look at just one verse of scripture today. I know that's shocking, but one verse of scripture, when last week we looked at <laughs> two chapters almost, uh, but Jeremiah 6, 16, this is what the Lord says. Who said it? The Lord says it. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient path. Hmm. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Uh, give you a little context here. Uh, uh, God has called and rose up the prophet Jeremiah uh, to go uh, to the people of the nation of Judah uh, to call them to repentance for their sins, to call them back to God. Um, and the people had fallen into just such uh, disrepute and, and sinful ways uh, that in Jeremiah 6.10, uh, it tells us that they couldn't even hear God, you know. They couldn't hear uh, what God uh, was saying uh, to them. It says, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them and they find no pleasure in it. This is the state that the people had found themselves in in the nation of Judah uh, uh, at, at this particular time that, that Jeremiah uh, is ministering. Does that sound familiar? Sound familiar in the world that we're living in today? People don't want to listen to God. They don't want to hear anything about what God uh, has to say. Um, the prospect for those people of living for God didn't seem exciting because there's rules. You know, you can't do this. You can you can't do that. You can do this, but, you know, but not that over there. You can't go this far. There's rules and regulations. They just wanted to live however they wanted to live. They wanted to do whatever made uh, them happy. Um, but Jeremiah continued to, uh, to rebuke the people, to warn them, because the Babylonians were on their tail. The Babylonians uh, were looking to seize Jerusalem. They would ultimately attack uh, the city of Jerusalem, they would ultimately conquer the nation of Judah and lead them into captivity for 70 years. And God allowed that to happen uh, to the people of Judah because of the sin that they had found themselves in. So in that whole context of Jeremiah is, God is using Jeremiah to warn the people to say, you need to get, turn away from your sin. You need to stop doing the things you're doing. Put verse 16 for me back up there, Joe, if you will. Um, th then he says, the Lord is saying uh, uh, through the prophet Jeremiah, look, you're standing at the crossroads in your life. You, what, what's the crossroads? No, 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 literally. What is a crossroad? It's a split, you know. You can go one way or you can go the other. Right? And he said, you're standing at the crossroads roads and you're looking. And he says, ask for the ancient paths. He didn't say figure out something new. He didn't say ask for what is fresh and new and modern and all of that kind of stuff. Did he? He said, ask for the ancient paths. He goes on to tell them that, you know, what you're looking for is what's good. You know, ask where the good way is. Isn't that really what you're seeking to do when you try to change things and you, be, you become modern or whatever? You, you, you know, if your parents, you know, I see, I see this all the time. Uh, and, and because I'm younger, I, I hear people in my generation, they just want to change things for the sake of doing it. As if what happened before didn't work, you know. And I, I'm looking like discipline, for instance. That's certainly changed over the years, right? Now, we, we love to use that verse, spare the rod, spoil the child. Um, maybe not raise your hand because there's some mandated reporters here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know that I even know of anybody who quotes that verse that actually whips their child with a rod. Okay, so let's not be legalistic and insane and think that that verse means that you must do corporal punishment where you are beating children. That is not what that verse means. That verse just simply means that if you spare punishment, you will spoil the child. 
Whatever that punishment means for your child. You may not have to whip your children. I don't know how he did it and how she did it. But Jim and Kathy raised three girls, three, I guess not Ansley types because they would have had to beat them. But they didn't have to whip them. <laughs> Jim said, I didn't, I didn't have to whip none of my girls. I just looked at them. And I, I, was, I was telling Randy and his family just back here today, I said, I, I just scolded Ansley one time when she was still this, this tall with a passy, and she comes back at me. Mm. <laughs> I said, this one's getting beat with a rod right here. Okay? <laughs> that one, shot collar or something, you know. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I'll put it this way. I was not a horrible child. I don't care what Billy's around here trying to say. Um, but I was a good kid. But now he whipped me when I was little. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to do it now. But I remember one time he was, he was and he had a, a belt buckle, an old leather belt, and he whipped me with a belt. Now, the way he did it, he would tell me, listen, when you get home, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to get a whipping. Now, <laughs> I'm thinking, I got this. We got enough time to get home. I'm going to talk to him. He's driving. I remember clearly one time, you know, you really didn't have to wear seat belts back then, and I wasn't. I, I, was, wearing, I was sitting and leaned up to the front seat, and I think you were driving a Thunderbird uh, at the time, if I recall, T-tops or something. And, uh, but I was just talking, and he was talking, and everything was cool. He was just talking to me like nothing was wrong, and I thought, yeah. Yeah, I got out of that whipping, I'm telling you right now. And we got home, go to your room. What? No, 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 we were, don't you remember, man? We were talking, everything was cool. <laughs> you know, and he whipped, he, was, he whipped me. If he said he was going to do it, he would do it. And I, I remember that. And, and, and I, I think that's what you ought to do. If you say, you, don't, don't threat, if you threaten them that you're going to do something that you're not going to do, you might as well not say it at all. But I would just fall to the floor. This is why I said he can't do it anymore. Because I would just fall to the floor, and he would just pick me up with one hand. Well, <laughs> try it now, son. Come on. Uh, <laughs> pick me up with one hand if you want to. Uh, but, but you don't have, I, I was a kid that if you had just told me, I'm probably going to weasel, you know, out. Some kids you may have to actually spank. Some kids you may not have to do that. Some kids you may be able to take something away or put them in time out or stand in the corner or write or any of that kinds of stuff. I, I'm not telling you that you have to beat children. You most certainly do not. And you should not, you know, beat uh, uh, children. But just like if the cop goes and gives you a warning every time you speed, what's the likelihood after the 15th warning? I tell you what, like they did me by the third $300 ticket, I decided that I probably needed to slow down, you know? I thought, well, I can't even keep affording this. I'm paying for people's whole you know, uh, taxes in the county. Teachers were getting paid for my, <laughs> my tax money. I was given to Cripps County and Jones County and Bibb County and all of these places as I was, as I was traveling. Um, but you, you, you had to discipline. And there's this mindset in the world today that, well, you know, you should just, you, you know, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That may be the mindset, but it's not the reality. I get my feelings hurt all the time. You know, I, I, I look at ladders and stuff like that, and they say, I look at that ladder, and it says, look, this thing's got a weight limit. Well, you know, sometimes you can't do, sometimes you can't do things. The world we live in, you may, get your, you may get your feelings hurt for all kind of things. We can't worry about everybody's feelings uh, all the time, but we shouldn't go around just to give people offense. I'm not trying to say that uh, either. When you look at all the things that we have uh, in, in the world, uh, and, and, and you look at this idea of being old-fashioned, I want to take you to the spiritual connotation uh, that God is talking uh, to the people about here. They have a crossroad. You can go this way, you can go that way, and you can keep all these things in your mind that we've talked about uh, and how we've done things different. But in Christianity, we have gone way away. From, from, from the old paths, if you will. Now, <clears throat> I know, you know, we used to use these things, didn't we? What is that? Hymnal? What do you do with it? You mean somebody's got to tell you a page number? You got to hold it? Remember when we used them? Uh, I, was, uh, I was driving the van Wednesday night, 
and I was taking the youth home and Miracle over there, she's sitting, she's sitting in the passenger seat and she's on the phone with this fella. And I, I said, what is, this, what is this dude doing? She said, he's playing a video game, I, but they're not talking. There is no conversation happening. But they've been sitting on this phone for 15 minutes or something. And I said, what do y'all do? Just, you just hear what's happening on the other end of the phone? And she goes, yeah, yeah. She, she had an AirPod in, probably listening to music on the other thing. And I, and I said, you know, there was a day that you would have run out of minutes. And she went. <laughs> that was foreign to her. And at that moment, at that moment, I felt old. <laughs> and, and I said, <laughs> she had no idea there was a time that you had minutes, you know, uh, on, on, on different things. But that, when, that, that's, that's not the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. When you look at in, in, the, in the church today, we, we have gone wrong. You've got this, you can go to the new way, you can go to the old way. And God is looking at, uh, at telling the Israelites, you have not always acted this way. You've not always been in this kind of sin. Uh, you know, they, they were not perfect uh, people. Uh, God's people were certainly not perfect. You can read throughout the Bible uh, about that. But he tells them to look for the ancient ways, to go back to those ancient paths, go back to the time when they were communing with God, when they were not sinning. And what does he tell them? If they'll do that, they're going to find what? And it's in the next part of the verse. Huh? Rest for your souls. What do you find if you continue to go down the other path away from God? Yeah. Uh, in the Sunday school lesson this morning, we were in John chapter 5, and uh, we're talking about the man who was uh, uh, healed uh, at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, one of the problems I have with the Sunday school material is they really didn't put in verse 14 of John chapter 5 like they should have, because that's when Jesus found the man who he had healed. He said, take up your mat and walk. He found him, and in verse 14, he says, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. See, a lot of times we, 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 we certainly in the church today, we, we, we want all that good stuff. We want all, and I showed my class this morning uh, a, a, a video of uh, Mark Hall from Cast and Crowns uh, giving a, a little bit of an interview kind of conversation about the Cast and Crowns, the song Healer. And, and one of the things that Mark Hall had said, you know, we, we want the healing in the church today, but we don't want the healer. You know, we want, we want what God's got to give us. And, and he went through this, this little litany of how people would come up to God and say, you know, give me water. And what would he say? I am living water. They said, give us bread. He would say, I am the bread of life. They would say, give us life. I am life you know and that's kind of the crossroads that we are in the church today there are plenty of people that pack churches there are plenty of churches right now today that have hundreds and thousands of people that are sitting in church services today but they are just like all of those people that were out there in the world uh, in the ancient times that were following jesus they wanted what jesus could give them but they didn't want jesus they didn't want the rules and regulations. They didn't want the thing where I got to clean up. I got to stop sinning, as he told this man at the pool of Bethesda, as he told the woman who was calling the act of adultery, go and sin no more. They don't want that. They just want to be able to say, just like when they were building the golden calves and all those images, those are things that you can bring out and you can worship that golden calf and you can worship that image. And when you're done with it, you put it on the shelf and you put it away. And that's how, that may be how many people right here think about God. That may be your new way. That you know, you just, you, you, you want God to give you a healing. You want God to answer your prayer. You want him to do everything for you. And he's looking and going, but where have you been? Where have you, he wants, what God wants, what is, let me ask it, let me ask it, not say it. What does God want above all else? He wants you. Years ago when I was just the associate pastor here and I was preaching a sermon for uh, Brother John, I put four pillars, these, well, 
they're hidden now. But the, these little uh, pillars that we have, I put one on that side, two here, and one over there. And I preached a sermon about, and I put boxes on top. And inside of that box, uh, I, I told the people in the message, I said, inside of that box is everything, all the tools that we need to give God for him to be able to work in our lives. And that's your toolbox, if you will. And I got the people at the end of the sermon, everybody lined up behind there, and they come up and they look at the box. I said, don't say anything about what you see. Just open the box and close it. And people would open the box, look, and go, do you know what was in the box? There was, huh? A mirror. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, you remember me telling you? It was a mirror in that, and it said on the top, all he needs is you. That's all he's needing. All of these other things that we try to do and we try to bring, he's not required all that. He wants all of you, though. He wants all of your heart. He doesn't just want your mind. He doesn't just want your money. He doesn't just want your hands. He wants every bit of who you are. That's what he requires, okay? And he died and gave every bit of who he is so that we would be able to have that, okay? And so if you'll do that and you'll go and you will commune with him and you will have a relationship with God uh, to where you are talking to him and he's talking to you and you're loving on him and he's loving on you uh, and that you're listening to him. And when he says, don't do that, you don't do it. And when you do something and you disappoint him and he has some discipline, then you correct that error and you repent. You don't do it anymore. You will find rest for your souls but so many people sitting in here and so many people all over the world give the same answer the nation of Judah gave we will not walk in it and guess what he did all right Babylonians come in Nebuchadnezzar comes in takes them over not a good situation wasn't God asking the people to return to what I would consider today, quote unquote, old fashioned ways? When it comes to God, uh, there's a word that I want to make sure people understand, and it's called immutable. It means that God doesn't change. Um, when it comes to God, there's no upgrades, there's no updates that you have to do. Uh, God is the same Yesterday, he is the same today, and he's going to be the exact same tomorrow. You don't have God 2.0, 3.0, iPhone 14.x, or none of that kind of stuff. This is an old God, and he's got some old ways. And, you know, we may come in and we may worship him a little bit different. We may wear different clothes. We may sing sometimes different songs. This morning, we've had a, a lot of different songs. Some of them some people like. Some of them other people didn't like because you say, well, I want to hear more old songs because I'm more old-fashioned. And some of the songs we were singing that were quote-unquote contemporary are old. <laughs> by standards of contemporary uh, type, type music. We have these different things that we want to bring uh, to, to the table uh, to God. He doesn't, it doesn't matter to God when it comes to how our hearts sometimes worship. It is that we worship him and that we serve him and that we are, uh, we are living for him. And that may look a little bit different. There are people all over the world right now that are sitting in mud huts that walk miles and miles to get to that place just so they could hear one person that has a Bible because they don't have Bibles. They can't have Bibles like you and I, all of us do. And it would be a sad situation this morning. I hate to do it, but I am. If I asked somebody today and I just started asking y'all to pick up your Bible and turn and read something for me, how many people would have to go to your phone And guess what? Those people will walk just to find that one person, maybe he's an actual pastor, maybe he's just a lay person, that one person in that mud hut somewhere that will read them the word of God. And we sit back and think, oh, we better put a coffee shop in our church. Well, we better have this, we better have that, or people won't come. I'm just going to put it to you this way. I mean, I want certain things. I mean, we want air conditioners. I do. I don't have to have a heater, you know, not in Georgia. But I like air conditioning. I like the fact that there's, there's padded pews there, that we have lights. 
Do we have a roof that's not leaking all on us right now, unless you're in the youth room upstairs? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I heard you. Uh, we, 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 we want those types of things. I'm not saying that we should go out and build mud huts and all that kind of, that kind of stuff. But God, it, if people do not come to God just by reading this story, they don't care about coffee shops. They don't care about all the trappings. We were talking this morning in my Sunday school class about different churches. And people get, they get down on other churches sometimes, uh, uh, whether it's big churches that say small churches don't do this or don't have that, or it's people that say, oh, I don't like that church over there. They have, I'm using the example. They have a coffee shop. Who cares? If they want a coffee shop, have a coffee shop. What's, what, there's nothing, the Bible doesn't say you can't have a coffee shop. Uh, and they're about that. But I want to put something to you. We're talking about different churches, and these churches have big programs and uh, Xboxes and, and games and all that kind of stuff. And I was a youth pastor for nine years. Uh, and one of the things I observed is this new path we have seen to take in the church. Let me ask you a question. We, we split all of our age groups up. You know, you got nursery. You, know, you have classes for one-year-old, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, first grade, second grade, third grade, all that stuff. Children's churches, youth group, everybody's separate. Nobody's worshiping together. You know, the, the whole youth group movements and children's church movements and separate pastors and all that for all of those things. Has it worked? The, if you were to graph what's taken place 50 years ago, there may be right at 50 years ago, that's when the youth group movement stuff started and we started segmenting everybody. There's many of y'all in here where, where were you at on Sunday morning? In a youth group? You were in a sanctuary. We started all that, and you say, hey, it seems to make sense. I mean, I agree, it seems to make sense. But what I'm submitting to y'all today, it hasn't worked. We've segmented everybody. We put all this curriculum, we put all this money, we hire all these specialized pastors and people to do all of that kind of stuff, and the graph has just went, kaboom. It looks like the stock market stuff in 2020 when you look at a graph over there. I wonder, I want to submit to you, I wonder when as a church we're ever going to look and go, maybe we're missing something. Maybe we ought to, because this isn't working, maybe we ought to go back to what we knew was working and try that for a minute, you know. If I, I, I'm just smart enough, if I'm doing, if I've changed and that's not working any better and I don't know where else to go, I'm going to go back to the default position. You know, you're going to hit the default button and go back to what you know was working and then start from there again. It's insane to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and expecting a different result. And I'm telling you, whether it's discipline, whether it's how we think about uh, work ethic or how we, how we go about church or whatever, not all of these things in and of themselves are big problems. But I want you to leave here today knowing this one fact. When it comes to you just communing with God and doing what God has said to do, and you going back to this old book, this is one ancient instruction manual. I don't care what church you go to or what pastor that you listen to, there has not been an update to this. It is a different translation that may have some problems in the translations that are out there. But there has not been an update to God's Word. It's an old instruction manual. Don't believe that you got, <laughs> don't believe the lie that if you will water it down, if you will entice the people more with all these cheap imitations of the world stuff, then they'll fill those pews. It's a lie. I'm going to promise you something right now. There's a, two empty pews right there, a couple back there. I guarantee y'all I can fill them. Oh, we'll do it. We'll do it in the play. I guarantee you I can fill them next week. It is not a problem getting people in church. Feed people, give away something free, you know, have some kind of entertainment. You can get people in here. How you keep them? How you keep them? Guess what? Ain't my problem. Because neither could Jesus. He never told me to. I'm not trying to sit here and build a business. 
I'm not trying to say, well, that pew's got to be filled next week because the more money we get, I get a commission and I'll get some more if I can get more money in the offering plate. If you do what God needs you to do, he's going to send you. He'll, he's the one sending people where they need to go. I won't, and we talked about a little bit last week G, uh, and on Wednesday night. Jesus said, I won't lose any that the Father has sent me. Okay? I want people in this church that God has sent, not people that I beg to come here. I want people, I want the people that are tore up that God has sent us. I'm not saying we, I want people that are broke spiritually, you know, financially. I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying that I want people like, well, if y'all are rich, you know, give up all your money because all he wants is broke people. I'm not saying that. But my point is, I want anybody that God sends to this church. I don't want just people that are highfalutin or rich or any of that are cleaned up and they don't ever sin or any of that kind of stuff. You know, we want all people that God sends to this church come whoever God sends. Okay. All people should be feeling welcome. And he's going to send people. And he's going to do those types of things. And I'm not going to sit here and just try to act like this is a, a business in that way. The folks that come, we try to do right by everybody that's here. And I try to know people. It's a shame to me, really, that last week I had a grandmother come up to me after we had the baptism and said, thank you, with tears in her eyes, thank you so much for personalizing every person that you baptize today. And I was standing right here, and I thought, you're welcome. Uh, I don't, I was shocked a little bit. And then Wednesday night, Cheryl Strange said the same comment. And I thought, is it odd? I don't, this is the only way I've ever known to do it. It was how they did it when I was being baptized. And I, and I realized that, no, there are churches when you, I mean, we, we had eight. But then when you had 20 or 30, I guess it would be a little bit difficult. But they just go up there and doosh, 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 and just, you know, go. I would just stand there by the line, get a super soaker, and just spread them in the face. It's a holy thing. It's extremely holy. I think, I mean, I, 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 I am old-fashioned. I, I, hey, my birthday's on the March 31st. I'll be 35, okay? Let, just so y'all know. I'm old-fashioned for my age, and I don't make apologies for it. I was raised by my grandparents, and there's a lot of things I look at, and, you know, certain things you need to change, certain things you don't. But I can tell you this. I've been in ministry long enough that the church, the ecclesia, the gathering, the building, what we do here, we need to go back to a lot of older ways. And some people say, yeah, we're going to get rid of the screens and go back to hymns. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. We're going to still keep the screens and not going to go into the book. But the way we think about each other, the way we are a family, how we accept people, how we go about serving the Lord, how we go about studying his word, all of those things, we need to go back to the old ways. And we need to realize that this new stuff hasn't been working and it will not. The more you segment and you split families, families don't even know how to worship today together. Kids never see parents pray. They don't see you raise your hand. They don't see you going through stuff. They're all somewhere else. We need people together, okay? You need to be together. We have meet and greet here. We have finally after COVID. Because even in this church of 100 people, you look around and you don't know people's names. You don't know who that person is. George and Terry Lacero right there. Or Randy and Danielle and uh, Salem is the boy and, and Travis, right? And Grace. Ha! <laughs> that's the standard y'all got to meet because they just came this morning, okay? That, that's that, that's, that's y'all's standard. But we don't even know, and I don't know your name, sir, but I'm going to get your name before you leave, okay? Uh, but you, you don't even know people right in here. You can have mediocre preaching, mediocre singing, mediocre facilities, but if you have a congregation of people that serve the Lord and love the Lord, people will want to be a part of that place. That's what you got here. Okay? And God will do the rest. Ask God 
for the old ways. Ask God for the ancient ways. And it's okay in areas to be old-fashioned. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> and we're going to have communion. Father God, I praise you and I thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word today. And Lord, I just pray that we would not have in our vernacular old-fashioned to be a, a, a dirty word, to be something that is frowned upon, uh, Lord. And, and as we've said, there are many things that change, and change is okay. But Lord, when we, look, when we look about how your word tells us how to lead our families, how to love people, how to forgive, how to worship you, how to humble ourselves, Lord, to, to do away with sin and to not celebrate sin and not make things that, that are clearly not okay to be okay just so that we can fill pews more or put more people in our churches and have a bigger tent, uh, Lord, and cast our nets a little bit wider uh, that are out there. Father, we have to stand upon the truth that is of your word. And if your church will do that, if this church will do that, then, Lord, we will be pleasing and honorable to you. And, Lord, I just pray that we would not just change for change's sake, that we would not just replace things, uh, Lord, in our lives and, and uh, anything, uh, Lord, unless it's better uh, and it brings more value. And certainly, Lord, that we would evaluate how our faith is and how our practices are uh, in our faith, in our churches, in our homes. And, that, Lord, if it's an old-fashioned way, but it works and it's right, we'll stick with that until you lead us to change. And Lord, as this world is consistently shoving down our throats things that are just insane and things that, Father God, we know and every rational human being knows are clearly not the way to go. Father, I pray that we would resist those things and we would stick to your word and we would find rest for our souls. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our ushers are coming forward. And we're